Would you like to see an x-ray of your soul, an x-ray of your emotional infrastructure? Well, just like the body today with scans, with x-rays, with different types of technologies, we can see the inner workings of what makes us tick. We have a blueprint that will give you a picture of the spectrum of your emotions and understanding how they work and what you can do to improve them. Check out the description below, the special Omer book, 49 Steps, Personal Refinement, Character Development, Understanding and Cultivating the Very Nature of Your Emotional Being. Do you have any idea of how much pain and pleasure impacts your life? How many, of your, how many of your decisions are determined by these two factors? Avoiding pain, gaining pleasure, or working around pain. And pain is very broad. There's physical pain, there's psychological pain, there's chronic pain. I'm really speaking about it in the broadest possible sense. Nobody really can even quantify how much time, energy, money is spent on dealing with pain, how much downtime that people don't go to work, how it affects relationships, how it affects so many of our life, our life decisions. And the same with pleasure on the other end of the spectrum, and that is people looking to gain pleasure whether it's physical pleasure, whether it's carnal pleasure, whether it's spiritual pleasure. But it would seem, especially if you put it into very blunt terms, that these are the two most driving forces in human life. I mean, ask any Madison Avenue executive, the advertising world, marketing. The key to marketing is to stimulate a reaction. And what are the strongest reactions people have? It's either to avoid pain or to gain pleasure. And sometimes they're interdependent. Some of our pleasures are in order to avoid pain. Now, of course, there are masochists, the concept of having pain from ple ple pleasure from pain. So how do we approach this, not just in a circumstantial way, in a reactionary way that we react. Okay, I'm in pain, let me figure out what to do. The pain is too strong, I'll take a painkiller. I'll numb myself in some other way. Most of this is really done, most, for most of us, reflexively, impulsively. It's not driven by a deliberate plan. Because pain and pleasure are clearly emotional experiences or, I should qualify that, we shall see that it's not purely that. But for many of us, that's what it is. And therefore, we react in that way that emotions react. We don't sit down and make a plan and say, okay, how am I going to avoid pain and how am I going to gain pleasure? Things get stimulated. You walk down the street, you're seduced by something. Something tempts you. You think you can have pleasure from it. Sometimes it's going to be a healthy pleasure. Sometimes it won't be a healthy pleasure. Sometimes, in most cases, it will be instant gratification. Temporary, or sometimes longer lasting. And frankly, it's not even discussed enough, especially as we're younger in our formative years. Yeah, of course, our child's in pain. We'll take them to a doctor, we'll find Advil or, uh, or uh, Tylenol or aspirin or whatever the different options there are. Again, all behavioral, all symptomatic, addressing symptoms, not the roots. But if you ask, if you, if you, when's the last time you had a conversation? How can you grow older? How can you grow into an adult and have the least amount of pain in your life? I mean, I say by pain, obviously physical pain, but also existential pain, a psychological and emotional. How do we build ways to gain healthy forms of pleasure? Most of us are left basically in the cold to just figure it out on our own, and usually we don't even figure it out. That is why it's so important to go back and try to discuss it 
I don't want to call it academic because I'm, I don't like academic, which is divorced and detached from reality and life. But academic in the sense of understanding it somewhat stepping back, not because I'm in pain right now or I'm seeking pleasure right now, but how do we look at it in a more objective light? And hence the science and Kabbalah of pain and pleasure. So let's begin with the science of it. Freud and other schools of psychology, not everybody agrees, put things somewhat in those terms, the pain and pleasure principle. What people do is that the big drive in human beings is avoiding pain and gaining pleasure. Pleasure, very often connected with the sexual dimension of it, but not only. And we see what people will do. What will people do for these two things? They will go to the ends of the earth to gain pleasures. They'll do things that are irrational, that are destructive, that will hurt themselves and others. And the same thing with avoiding pain. What will a person do in, their real, in real pain? Someone's tortured. They will do things that you would never expect. So it makes, it's very tempting to argue that these two are the big strongest forces in life. You know, take them away. Yeah, people can live their lives in other ways, but at the end of the day, these two forces are going to end up creating most of our decisions. Why is a person driven to be successful, wealthy? Because it gives them pleasure, makes them happy. They feel, they feel accomplished, fulfilled. You can do whatever you want. You can have whoever you want. You can travel wherever you want. All that comes down to a pleasure thing. How much is spent time, energy, as I mentioned before, to avoid pain? The, the, just the pharmaceutical industry. Now, what I didn't even get into, drug addiction, different addictions that are addicting us either to the pleasure it gives us or to avoiding the great pain. I remember a person in my community, very fine man, and he was an alcoholic. And as much as we tried to put him back straight to get him, what do they say, off the saddle, on the saddle, off the, off the wagon, on the wagon, we couldn't do it. We tried. I remember as a student, we were idealistic. We got him a new set of clothes. We took him to a restaurant. We treated him like a king. We gave him a hotel room. But he went back to him. Then I asked him privately, one-on-one. He says, you don't have to, you understand. You have to understand. He said to me, using my name, Simon. He said, I have terrible, when I was a, 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 what do you say, a young adult, 21 or 20, developed a very, very chronic back pain. I could not, I was 24-7 living in pain. Couldn't sleep. So I began taking, trying this, trying that, then I began to drink. The drinking was simply to numb it. That's all I was drinking. Then that became my choice. I'd rather be drunk than have that type of chronic pain. How can I judge a person like that? You know, obviously we always look for a third option. But that's one of the first times I, I could recognize that some people are living in this terrible pain and it drives their entire life. It's hard to imagine. Your whole life is driven to just somewhat minimize, mitigate, silence, numb the pain. And that was back pain. How many of us have other types of pains? Distress, traumas, fears, insecurities that feed our actions that shape who we are. And as a result, we're going to do things, either to minimize or numb, or to gain some form of pleasure. That, that also is a form of numbing. So that, it's not a surprise then, when you look in scientific studies, especially in the last decade or two, where actually studies have shown something really seemingly ironic or paradoxical, that the same regions in the brain that are stimulated when a person has pleasure, whether it's food, other pleasure, sexual pleasure, are also stimulated when a person is in pain. The dopamine chemical, which is generated through pleasure, has also been associated with pain. Now, how do you explain that? They seem to be two different ends of the spectrum. But if you think about it, they really are both a stimulant. They're just coming from two different ends. Is there something really in common 
And can we discover what that, at the root, what, is it, what it is? Not at the symptomatic level. And maybe then we can actually transform one into the next. Which can also explain why some people actually have pleasure from pain. Not all of us. Many of us could do anything possible to get rid of pain. Because there is something in common among them. So therefore the human drive to gain pleasure, the human drive to avoid pain, are very much interdependent. Because when you have pleasure, it's the opposite of pain. When you're in pain, it's the opposite of pleasure. A way of avoiding pain is sometimes having pleasure. Then there's another study that I had read about, which is even, even more fascinating in some ways. In the 50s, 1950s, that pre- approximately at that time when they were experimenting with different ways, and lobotomies were still acceptable. That cutting out certain regions of the brain for someone who was in deep chronic pain, people who live with pain all the time, was helping them. And a study showed that when people who went through that procedure were asked, they were asked, so, do you have no longer pain? Their response is, yes, I do have pain, but it doesn't bother me. I don't think about it. This gave researchers somewhat of a jolt and began to realize there's two aspects to pain. There's the very sensation of pain, okay, something that hurts you, and it sends the nerves, sends signals to your brain. And then there's how the brain processes pain. Is it possible that you may feel pain, but it won't bother you as much because in some way the brain doesn't process it that way? In other words, is the pain more a, a mind thing or an actual physical reaction? It reminds me, Lawrence Taylor, famous Giants linebacker. So he was known, he was famous and known for playing even when he was injured. Injuries that other people simply could not handle. So they asked him, how do you play when you're injured? LT, Lawrence Taylor. And he responded, it's mind over matter. When you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Now, yes, it's a nice line, but if you think about it, is that possible? That if you are able to in some way train your mind that something shouldn't matter or it's so important to you, say you'll tolerate the pain, what happens then? Is there less pain? Or is there another force at work inside our psyches that is doing something, maybe is giving us pleasure even, that counteracts the pain and doesn't weaken it, but it weakens it in your context and how it affects you. Which is why you see people who are driven to run a marathon or to be ballet dancers or to do other things that actually causes physical pain is because the pleasure or the reward, you can say, that they gain from it that generates dopamine in a way counteracts or neutralizes to some extent. Whether they feel the pain or not is a discussion. They may feel it, but it doesn't bother them that much. So then how much is the intellectual process part of it? Like, for example, when anesthesia or other forms that, that don't allow you to feel, it freezes the nerves. When they say numb you when you're doing dental work or other things like that. How much of that, you don't feel the pain, even though had you not have that anesthetic or any other thing, you would. You may feel a little later, or especially anesthesia, you go into a state where you don't feel pain in ways that are quite, quite um, amazing. What's going on? Does it mean that pain is not, it's not purely an objective thing? It's not just because somebody pricks you with a needle, you're in pain. It depends what else is happening. Just to drive, just to make the case that it's a lot more than it just meets, than meets the eye. So I'd like to submit. There's the science of pain and pleasure. And let's talk now about the Kabbalah of pain and pleasure. So long before these studies, and long before modern psychology and marketing, that either stimulates pleasure, pleasure seeking, pleasure giving products or services, or, or alleviating pain products and services. There's a book called The Sefer Yitzira. 
called the Book of Formation, considered to be, by many, the first mystical work, the first work of Kabbalah, some attributed to Abraham. Yeah, Abraham, the biblical Abraham. Whether he wrote the words or the ideas. There is another book called Raziel HaMalach, the angel Raziel, that some goes tribute to Adam. But the, the Sefiyot series is a far more famous one, and one that, I said, more authorities consider to be the original Kabbalistic work. There's one expression there that I want to talk about. It's actually a double expression. It says the following. The word for pleasure in Hebrew is oneg. Pleasure. Three consists of three letters. Ayin, nun, gimel, oneg. When you change the order of the letters, it also makes up another word called nega. Nega means um, a, uh, a disease, a leprosy, an affliction, seemingly opposite. So it says the following. Nothing is higher than pleasure. And nothing is lower than nega, which is, as I said, nun gimel ayin. So it's not exact opposite, but it's a reversal of the letters. The letter ayin is at the end. The middle letter of pleasure is the beginning, and the gimel is in the middle. Both three letters, just reversed, and that's one commonality, that they're different, different, com- different order of letters. And the second is that there's nothing higher than pleasure and nothing lower than this disease, than this affliction, than nega. Nega also means it affects you, it impacts you. But here, of course, it's referring to a negative impact. So nega can also be referred to wounds, injuries, and especially if you think about it in the psychological, emotional, and spiritual context, it refers to everything that in some way inhibits us and blocks us. Oineg, on the other hand, pleasure, is what opens up the channels. When a person is in pleasure, they're far more expansive. They literally feel lighter, more giving, and more expansive in every possible way. When a person is in pain, they're crouching in pain. Physical pain for sure, but every form of pain, it like limits you. You feel constricted, you feel limited. And yet they're made up of the same three letters, and they're two ends of the spectrum. Nothing higher, nothing lower. Now this goes back thousands of years. This is a text that goes back thousands of years. So how do we apply that? When you think about it, then the studies of science make total sense. These are two human experiences, both elicit and impact us in very profound ways, and we will do everything to gain pleasure and to avoid pain. It's also no surprise that it stimulates the same regions of the brain. So in essence, you could put it this way, the way in language, using mystical and Kabbalistic language, everything has a container and it has energy. The container is what we experience. It's like, just like you have a cup, and inside is water. Or you have words on a page that convey an idea. The idea is like the soul, the energy within the body. Everything is made up of body and soul. So if you think of pain and pleasure that way, what is the body of pain, and what is its soul? What is the body of pleasure, and what is its soul? And here's the key thing. The soul is connected in the same place. They both come from a strong, powerful energy. But then they digress into two different directions. That's why they're made up of the same letters. They're not different letters. Letters are the actual body of what these words mean. Same letters, just reversing them. Changing the order is the difference between night and day, between good and evil, between life and death, pain and pleasure. And one is on the highest end of the spectrum, one is on the lowest. But as the Kabbalists explain, that which is lowest comes from the highest. The higher something is, the lower it falls. The lower something falls, the higher it's rooted. Example given, the stones that fall off a wall, the farther they fall, the proof is that they come from the highest point on the wall. The stones that are lower on the wall won't fall that far. 
So when you think of it that way, then we're talking about what is the energy of it. So let's analyze, let's dissect pains first. So without, if we did not have pain in our lives, we would not be able to be alive. Pain is a warning signal. It's a red light. It's a red flag. If you feel pain, that means something is wrong. And it's warning you, do something about it. It's like actually giving you a heads up. If we didn't feel pain, we could hurt ourselves in ways that are unimaginable. You wouldn't know that your hand is near fire. You wouldn't know that you're biting your tongue. So many other things, we'd be numb to that. So yes, we'd be avoiding pain, but we would be in far more danger to the point of no return. So pain is basically saying, hey, it's an alarm clock. It's a wake-up call. Do something about it. Now, why then is pain so, why do we loathe pain? Because pain is uncomfortable. But it's not the pain is not the problem. The pain is, is telling you about the problem. So to get to use a painkiller, yes, that may be good for temporary short-term relief. But that's not never, never the solution. Because you haven't solved the problem. You're just numbing yourself to it. So that may be needed for the short term, but short term. So if you think about it that way, pain is not an end in itself. But when we focus on the container and we don't understand its energy, its soul, then that's all I care about, avoiding pain. Pain is a wake-up call. If you're feeling existential pain, you're feeling anxiety. Anything that causes you discomfort, it's your soul telling you there's something imbalanced, there's some misalignment. There's some imbalance. There's some dissonance. Do something about it. Realign. And automatically the pain will be relieved. Now I understand it's easier said than done, especially on a physical level. A person has chronic pain. So there is a cause. Now if you can, if you can heal at the root, obviously that's the goal. In the case of the individual I mentioned earlier or others, obviously people would love to get rid of their pain. Sometimes it's not so simple. Sometimes they can't even identify what the cause is. Or even if you identified, surgery won't work, other things don't work. But there's another thing that works. And go back to, if you don't mind, it doesn't matter. If indeed the energy of pain is coming from a very high place, the same energy of pleasure, is there a way to disconnect? Not disconnect the pain from feeling it, but how it affects you. So if you indeed recognize that you have a purpose in life. You have to run the marathon. You have to dance a, a dance. And in it, there's a certain element of pain involved, but the reward, the higher purpose, is greater than the pain. Then it doesn't minimize the pain, but it makes it less effect on your life. Now, I'm not suggesting this is an easy approach. Obviously, we do everything possible to get rid of pain on all levels. But... Don't think that that's the only thing that's necessary is to get rid of it. Also, is to channel it. It's just like when we talk about people who've gone through difficult traumas and suffering. So they can either continue to live with it, it can continue to demoralize and break their spirits, or they somewhat learn to heal. And they channel the grief, they channel the loss, they channel the trauma into positive activities. I've seen it done Many people have done this is called healing. And not that you're just avoiding a bad or painful past. You've transformed it. You've learned from it. You allow it to teach you and others insights you would never have gained unless you went through that path. And this is even true about physical pain. A person who has endured it has much to teach. Now, I'm not justifying it. I'm not trying to explain it. I'm trying to suggest of how we deal with it. And when you think of it that way, as pain and pleasure coming from two poles of one essential entity, then you ask yourself the question, let's go to the other way around. What causes you to have pleasure? So let's be honest. Most people's pleasure is short-term, is instant, is a one-night stand type of experience. Have pleasure. Especially today, the comforts that we live in. We don't have to struggle. You can get anything. I mean, just the, the explosion of... The accessibility of drugs of all sorts. What does that tell you? Because it's so accessible. And we have a lot of time. And we have options. 
So we have all kinds of ways of gaining pleasure. Why would I be dedicated to finding a pleasure that is more meaningful, more, more long-term eternal values? I have pleasure right now. Why do you leave me alone? And many people will say that. I've heard this from many. I, I, my life is fine. I'm happy. I'm happy. If you dig a little deeper and you see how sad it is. But I feel happy. I feel I'm gaining, I'm gaining pleasure. It's very hard to argue with that. But if you think about it, the same issue that we're addressing with pain is with pleasure. What gives you pleasure? Now we all at times have pleasure from very, let's call it low common denominator activities. Things that bring us down to levels that we sometimes are very ashamed of. And this can be in the sexual arena and it can be in other arenas. You know, people get pleasure from petty things, from nonsense, things that are that don't last. I mean, you can go to a comedy club and have laughter for a few hours. And it may even be good laughter. I'm not taking away from that to the need. But how, 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 how meaningful and how sustainable is that? So we have many ways to gain pleasure today, especially you go online, you just type in anything and you can distract yourself in many ways. And many are good things. I mean, listening to music, watching something really beautiful, reading poetry. I mean, there's many ways to experience beautiful pleasure, not denying that. But how much of our pleasure comes from things that we know are very... We don't think it's harmful, perhaps, but that does, it's not something that you can say is really let's say purposeful, something eternal is the word I would use. Then there's pleasure from, let's say, pleasure, I mentioned music, but let's talk about pleasure from an emotional relationship with someone. You love someone, and you have pleasure in that love. And it's a healthy relationship. It's not just using someone or they're using you. It's not just immediate, short term. It's a long term. Okay, that goes already into a much deeper category. You're talking about something that's building something. And it's pleasure that even lasts, even when you're not with the person you love, the whole relationship is pleasurable, even if they're a million miles away. Whereas the first type of pleasure is only when you're having it, when you're, when you're drinking, when you're eating, when you're sh- it's, it's, like a, it's like a sugar high. While you're, while you're eating the sugar, you're getting high. It won't last very long. On the contrary. Or pleasure from intellectual pursuits. Studying, learning, mastering something. Whatever it may be. That also has a very, a much more sublime, a much more we'll call it transcendent pleasure. But then there's the ultimate transcendent pleasure. Purpose in life. Meaning in life. That 24-7, your entire life, you know why you're here. When you wake up, you jump out of bed with an excitement. I have a purpose to my life. Is it the same type of pleasure like a sugar high? Perhaps not. But it's lasting. And it's like a foundation of a building. It may not look like fireworks all the time. It may not be glamorous, but it feeds you with an inner sense of purpose, an inner satisfaction, inner contentment and fulfillment. So when a person is able to find pleasure in that way, yes, there will be pains in life, but they'll be able to deal with it a lot differently because it's perhaps part of their purpose. It's not isolated. Just like the pleasure is not a bunch of disjointed and fragmented pleasures, the pains are also part of a story. I remember when my book Toward a Meaningful Life was published, there was a woman contacted me. She was from Toronto, but she would go visit. She came from Chicago, and she would visit her mother, who was already in a very terminally ill situation, and a lot, a lot of pain. And um, she would go to visit her and to read to her and speak to her, but she was at a point where she already was ready, uh, ready to sign a DNR, telling the doctors, you know, I, I, I can't go on like this. It's just too much pain. Let's just end it. Whatever legally way they can do it. So I think it was a, a DNR that she was ready to sign. At that time, her daughter tells me, I went to visit her and your book had come out. I decided, you know what, let me read to my mother this book. It was a very moving book for me. Maybe it will touch her as well. So I was in the hospital with her and I asked mom, what, 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 there's a new book that came out toward a meaningful life. What chapters would you like me to read to you? Now, my mom was a a lifetime teacher. She taught in schools for a long time. So she said, read the chapter on education. And the second one, read the chapter on pain and suffering. Because that's what she was enduring at the time. Okay, great. So, So just the gist of it, the chapter of education talks about that education is not just conveying knowledge and data and information, 
But education, you shape souls, you shape lives. You're teaching people to be the best they can be. So it's not just a, a person walking around with a lot of information. But that very person lives up to their purpose. And you as an educator have helped them actualize and discover themselves. That was the thing that touched her. Then came the chapter on pain and suffering, where there it talks about that if you sometimes add up all the joys of your life and all the pains of your life, pain may be, and pain and suffering may be longer list, longer column than the joys of your life, quantitatively. However, if you think qualitatively, purpose of life, purpose of life overrides the quantity. If I know my purpose, yes, I've had certain pains, I've had losses, I've had suffering, I've had setbacks. But the purpose is what gives me sustenance. And then the pains and the joys all become part of that larger purpose. Those are the two main points. This is exactly what happened. This is her daughter tells me on the phone. She says, my mother called the doctor in. She was visibly very deeply moved and said, I want to tear up the DNR and I want to live my life as long as I can because I was an educator. I shaped lives, purpose. And that continues, even though I'm not edu- teaching right now, but the satisfaction and anyone I meet, that's my life. And therefore the pain is there, but there's purpose. It had a visible impact on her. Now, I am sure her pain did not go away because of it. But on the other hand, she would say it did go away. Whether she physically felt it as much, I can't say. But it didn't matter as much because there was context. It's like the pain of giving birth. I never did, so I can't speak about it, but I can imagine it to some extent. The pain that you go through when you're bringing up children, there are many challenges. And sometimes the challenges are, 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 are overwhelming, is the right word I should say. Formidable. But there's the context. It's my child. I love this child. And the same thing with so many other aspects of life. So just as we talk about pain and pleasure, you could talk about love and pain. Though love is not exactly pleasure, even though there's association. But when you think of it that way, that there's nothing higher than pleasure, nothing lower than this pain, but they both come from the same letters. It's about transformation. It's about harnessing. It's about context. Now, I know this talk is not going to just solve your pain problems if you do have any of them. But I wanted to put it into context, perspective. And that indeed is the reason that they're so interconnected, both in our pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain, as well as the dopamine, as well as the brain regions, as well as the psychological dimension of it. But it's a far deeper aspect when you bring the soul into it. I don't want to just talk about it in a Freudian sense of pain and pleasure, like in a very reptilian mind approach about survival of the fittest, having as much pleasure I can in this world and avoiding as much pain as I can. But in a spiritual context, purpose. Because at the end of the day, as I do explain in the chapter Pain and Suffering, the real very possibility for pain is really coming from a place of pleasure. And this is the bottom line I want to emphasize here. The Arizal, the holy Arizal, Isaac Luria, he's the one that revealed the secret doctrine of Tzimtzum. What is Tzimtzum? That in place of an omnipresent and omnipotent divine consciousness that left room for nothing else but divine unity, space was created to allow for another independent consciousness to emerge. And that's the very nature of existence. That our consciousness, the human consciousness emerges. But where? In the so-called concealment of a higher divine, a higher transcendent consciousness. And the mission of our lives is to reconnect. But you cannot connect if you don't have the two different types of consciousness. So you must have the concealment. The concealment is the root of all problems. Because if it's misunderstood, and if you think it's an end in itself, it creates what we would call every form of injustice, every crime. Because if we, re- if we really, the human race, are all really one organism, how is it possible we can hurt each other? How can we have war? How can we cause pain to each other? Because we don't feel it. We don't feel that integral unity. So concealment has purpose 
But it also allows for pain. Just for example, the first day your child goes to school or to camp, there's a certain separation anxiety. But we know how important it is. The child has to become, be able to stand on his or her own feet. But there's a painful element. Just like the first time a child takes a step. They fall, they may cry, they may get hurt. But it wouldn't be a gift if you just held on to their hand. It's a gift you say to them, come walk to me. I'm here for you. You don't abandon them. But you want them to walk. And the only way to walk is to also fall. <clears throat> so in other words, the ultimate pleasure, both the divine pleasure, and ultimate pleasure is fulf- and fulfillment is when there's independence, which has potential for falling, has potential for pain. There'd be no pain if there was no void or vacuum. So it's not an end in itself. It's the possibility for it. So imagine now if we can reconnect to the divine consciousness. We can connect the independent con- human consciousness to a higher transcendent one. So then that unity eliminates every reason for pain. That's why pain will be eliminated. The problem is we get focused on the here and now and we think this is an end in itself. Life is an end in itself. Existence that I am self-absorbed, my my self-absorbed existence is an end in itself. It's not an end in itself. There's a purpose in it. So all pain really, spiritually speaking, mystically speaking, is rooted in this disconnect between you and your purpose in life. If there was a seamless connection, there'd be no pain, there'd be no death, there'd be no dissonance. But there is a disconnect. And that ultimately evolves in every form of pain that we experience, even physical pain. So what's the solution? Is to reconnect, to reattach. That's why you see children who feel love, feel nurtured, like flowers that thrive and blossom when they're watered. There's a certain seamlessness. You don't even need to point it out. Health doesn't feel like anything. Pain feels like something. The sensation of pain means something is disconnected, something is off. So it's a warning signal, it's a reminder. Do something about it. Reconnect. Now this doesn't mean just because you reconnect, suddenly all the pain disappears. But it means that's the process. And the more you reconnect to your purpose and to your mission in life and your calling, the less pain there will be in your life. Starting with psychic pain, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and ultimately even physical pain. So it's really the search for unity the search for pleasure, which really is a connection, a seamless connection, total fusion. And pain is its opposite, is the disconnect. And hence, both of them the same letters in Hebrew, and one is on the highest and one is the lowest, but the point is that the lowest originates from the highest. So the greatest pleasure you will have from your children, the greatest pleasure you will have from anything that you accomplish in your life, even if you have no children, is when you see an independent entity, not an extension of you, not a clone, but they're living up to their purpose. So on one hand, the potential for conflict, but on the other hand, you find the harmony within that diversity. So in other words, without the potential for pain, you can't have ultimate pleasure. The potential of pain and then overcoming that creates the ultimate pleasure. That's how we have to look at life. So if you took away pleasure, you would have no pain. If you took away pain, you wouldn't have pleasure. This is not a justification. It's an analysis, dissecting the anatomy of pain and pleasure, according to science and according to Kabbalah. The science and Kabbalah of pain and pleasure. And the Kabbalah, the inner dimension, the soul of it, can illuminate. And I have no doubt that if researchers and scientists and thinkers would take these principles, they can turn them into actual modalities that can help us Pain management, minimizing pain, gaining pleasure and healthy pleasure, and in so many areas that affects our lives today, which were being addressed, which is being addressed all the time by scientists, by researchers, by marketers, by people who both from, for, for good reasons and some people for their own nefarious reasons. So I hope this conversation. Can, this discussion can end up in being a much larger conversation by sharing it with others. And let's hear what people say. Let's create a dialogue here. A dialogue among different voices and see, put our heads together 
what we can glean and learn from the deeper mystical ideas of pain and pleasure and applying it to literally to even medical interventions and applications that can help us all in our personal lives. This has been Simon Jacobson. I want to thank you. Meaningful Life Center, go to MeaningfulLife.com and you can find a wide array of materials, a full calendar of events, programs, both video, audio, podcasts, text, things you can watch, short, long, calendar. Each Every day we have other offerings. Please take advantage of it. Love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your suggestions. And please share this with anyone you see fit. Thank you again. Be blessed and be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.